here at the University of Nairobi in our nation's capital. I want to welcome you in a very special way, as I've said earlier, to our seminar this afternoon in this continuing series. First, we had uh, Malimu uh, Gripat Wafula, who started this series uh, sometime in January, uh, when he spoke about um, debates on heritage conservation and, and, and what needs to be done in Kenya particularly. In the last presentation, we had uh, Alina Ashwald, uh, who is one of our research associates here in the department, uh, talking about uh, the dialectics of automobility and its influence in the wider society using the case study of uh, Nyanza here in Kenya. And, and there was a lot of uh, discussion uh, uh, thereafter. Uh, friends, today we have uh, one of our own, uh, Mr. David Neville Masika. Uh, Mr. Masika is um, a tutorial fellow in uh, our department. And uh, I will hasten to add that he has just submitted his uh, dissertation, PhD dissertation, which is going to be examined uh, shortly. And um, he has been working for the last uh, quite a few years, is it four years now, on the violence in Mount Elegon uh, in Western Kenya. And uh, I have the privilege of uh, having been his supervisor all along. And uh, no wonder that I'm going to be uh, the moderator and discussant of his presentation uh, this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Masika's uh, uh, broad research interests are on the political economy of war and conflict. And in this presentation, uh, this Nairobi afternoon, he argues that uh, intra and inter ethnic conflicts have been commonplace in Kenya's uh, post colony in such a ways that have tested the state hegemony to its inelastic limits. In the shadows of such a conflict, Mr. Masika says, are econopolitical networks which make massive profits. In this presentation, he will demonstrate how profiteers, smugglers, and black market margins were linked into a wave of war profit in Mount Elegon in Western Kenya in the period preceding the military intervention in 2008. I think uh, without much ado, uh, Mr. Masika, it's now my humble duty to just welcome you uh, to speak uh, to us. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, uh, members, of the audience, thank you uh, for joining us this afternoon. As Dr. Mbongi said, uh, today I want to engage uh, the debate on uh, uh, the markets of war and the benefit, the profiteers and racketeers in Mount Elgon. I want to pick just before I came, uh, I got deep into this debate from where we, uh, I talked about Mount Elgon's last time, where we argued that the conflict in Mount Elgon is informed by the contest over land, uh, which is a little bit historical and majorly because of mismanagement of land allocation or distribution in the region. And uh, this began long before colonialism, but then it was exacerbated by the colonial regime. Later on, uh, the post-colonial regime made the situation worse by simply adopting almost this uh, mechanism that we lead 
communities there to engage in conflict. And we dis I discussed the context of land and how it informed the SLDF led war. But today I want to ask, I want us to debate in what are the benefits? What are the polit uh, political economy that informed uh, this conflict? Do, do we have racketeers? Do we have beneficiaries? And, and that's what I want us to uh, debate this day. And I begin by saying that war in Mount Elgon evolved from a land dispute or land dispute between various ethnic communities that live there. But what I will zero on today is the conflict between the Soy and the Mosop. And that does not mean that Mount Elgon is inhabited by those two uh, groups of people only. It's a cosmopolitan area with the Bukusus living there, the Sabaot, the Kisi, the Gikuyu, we, uh, the, the region is cosmopolitan. So this conflict that I'm talking about evolved from the dispute, particularly with the allocation of land in Chepuk uh, phase three, Chepuk settlement scheme uh, phase three. And the war literally hinged on uh, historical events surrounding the land uh, question, specifically around the question of mis mismanagement of Chepuk settlement uh, phase three. I'm, I'm mentioning phase three because phase one was done a little bit well, phase two was done well, but phase three is where the major problems um, uh, the major problems were, particularly between the soy uh, clans allied to the soy group and those uh, allied to the uh, Mosop. Now, with mismanagement or the government failed to manage this distribution well and therefore informed conflict in the, in the region. That one we, I discussed last time. Uh, and uh, with no peaceful settlement of land issue in the region, the soy or the clans aligned to the soy believed that the Mosop were responsible for the mess that they found themselves in. And that therefore uh, led them to form the SLDF or the Sabaut Land Defense Force, particularly when the administrators, the provincial administrators tried to evict members of the soy from the region. And therefore they formed the Sabaut Land Defense Force with an intention of defending the position of the soy people in Chepuk settlement scheme phase three. With this militia group, they began attacking members of the Mosop and other communities that live there to eject them out. Feeling threatened, uh, the Mosop formed the Moorland Defense Force. They called it more land because naturally the Mosop live at the higher uh, part of the mountain while the Soy live at the lower part. So they formed the more land uh, defense force to defend themselves. So th majorly the two militia groups began engaging in a contest or in war. But then they were not just attacking the two they also extended to attack the non sabaut communities that lived there. And this would therefore lead uh, to people like the Bukusu to form what was known as the political revenge movement, the political revenge movement to defend the Bukusu interests in the area. And then we had another militia group called the Progressive Defense Force, uh, which was working a little bit together with the government institutions uh, to deal with uh, this about land defense uh, force. But then 
the Sabaut Land Defense Force was more organized and it's managed to sustain a war uh, between these other militia groups. With all these militia groups, the mountain blew into a full war, which lasted for more than three years before the government formally intervened by deploying uh, the military. The conflict had begun in 2004, but the government will deploy the military in 2008. And that will mean that the government had left these communities to engage or the militia groups to engage in this uh, full-blown war. Uh, also, during that period, the government institutions, that's the police institution, the provincial administration were unable to deal with the situation on the ground because SLDF now began hitting at those institutions. And by 2006, they had managed to eject the government from the government institutions from the region. And the last blow was when they hit uh, Cheptai's uh, GSU camp, where they looted it, vandalized it, and, and therefore the government was minimal in the, in the region. Uh, this, by 2008, there was a lot of outcry from various organizations, including the church groups, calling upon the government to respond. And this will therefore uh, force the government to deploy the military in 2008. Under the code, uh, under the code Operation Okoa Maisha or Save Life, because there were lots of atrocities that had taken place in Mount Elgon, including amputation, rape, killings, and displacement of people. So the government deployed uh, the military under the code Operation Okoa Maisha, which lasted for four months. And with that operation, they managed to kill the self-declared commander, uh, Wycliffe Kirui Matakwe, and other members took off. But at the end of it, they dismantled 98% of the militia group, or the Sabaut Land Defense Force. Uh, now, that's just a brief introduction, because that's not my main uh, area of debate today. My main area of debate today is that we have spoken about the atrocities and anytime people hear about Mount Elgon, they say, all right, there are killings, uh, atrocities committed against humanity, uh, people displaced. But lest do we know that under the shadow behind the cameras of bloodshed, there is profit making. That is where uh, I'm going to uh, zero on. That in as much as we talk about destruction of property, in as much as we talk about killings, in as much as we talk about other atrocities committed and displacement, but also we forget that the main actors in the conflict uh, made a lot of profit, made a lot of profit. And that is the subject of my debate uh, today. Under the banner, markets of SLDF war, who are the profiteers? Who are the profiteers uh, from this conflict? And I want to say that there is a lot that happens in war zones. There's a lot. Uh, anytime we hear of war zones, and I think those who are following what is happening in the world, if you look at what's happening in Europe, we hear of the bombs landing, and a lot indeed happens. The NGO world comes with human rights violations. People talk about this. Everybody talks about the violations. Uh, so a lot happens in the war zones, which in most cases, on most African states, it takes place at the age of the official state order. The age of the official state order. What do I mean here? Is that it takes place mostly at the periphery where the state 
presence is minimal, where the government institutions might have no authority or they are very minimal in their operations. And therefore, there's a lot that takes place uh, down there. And a classic example is Mount Elgon. In Mount Elgon, during the SLDF uh, conflict, the government was very minimal to a level that the militia, SLDF, for example, became a government on its own, imposing taxes, imposing a judicial system, which was punishing those who went against it. And so it was a government of its own. Uh, uh, in this area where the government is very minimal, the idea of profiteers emerge. The idea of profiteers uh, emerge. And many scholars have narrated this. Uh, many have talked about atrocities of war and victims of the situation. And very little, or there's a lot of silence what, on what happens in the hidden space, in the shadow, in the hidden space, in the shadows of those uh, conflict. There is, in the hidden space, there is a picture of profiteers or racketeers. Racketeers are these people who are benefiting, who are making illegal benefits. And I will tell why we call it illegal. And also the subject of illegality uh, is debatable because uh, if people will tell you that, look, yeah, the government is absent, then what makes us illegal? Because the government is not there. Uh, the government is minimal or the presence is not felt. Uh, and so uh, what happens in that hidden space is a picture of profiteers. These are uncomfortable truths. They are uncomfortable uh, truths of what happens there. Under the label uh, benefit from the conflict. I'm saying uncomfortable truths. Because in most cases, governments of the day will not want to agree that their presence is minimal down there. Uh, and they will come out chest thumbing or speaking fire. But down there, they might be absent. People don't feel them. People don't see the presence of that government. And, and that's why I'm saying uncomfortable truth. And within that, there are those who are benefiting from that conflict. There are those who are making a, a kill or becoming very rich because of that conflict. And we, I'll be walking you through uh, them. Uh, I want to say that Although the, uh, the SLDF-led war in Mount Elgon began because of land grievances and the government came in to silence the guns, uh, to silence the guns, but later the actors in this conflict uh, shifted their intention and commodified the war. They made uh, the conflict as a commodity which they were selling to gain a lot of profit from it. Uh, this is because uh, uh, the, the, this is because there was a lot of business taking place, even in the shut in the uh, behind the cameras of bloodshed. Some uh, most of the time we could see uh, the victims cry, but behind those cameras there was a lot of profit making that was going uh, was taking place, and this idea has been supported by. Uh, scholars who agree with the political economy of war or the political economy uh, of violence. Uh, thus, such scholars include uh, people like Boyne, Benoit, uh, Benoit, who developed an, a hypothesis that wars have positive economic growth for those who make profit from it that wars have positive economic growth uh, for those who make a profit out of it. In as much as what the media focuses mostly on 
the grievances of the people, but then there are those who make profit out of uh, this. And this, his argument, Benoit's argument, is supported by the Keynesian economic theory, uh, where uh, scholars who support this idea argue that economic activities practiced in war, economic activities uh, practiced in war can be treated as expansionary fiscal economic policy, economic policy. And this same idea is supported by scholars such as Paul Kulia and Anger Hofler, uh, who view war as proxies for profit making. That within war, there are those who utilize it as proxies uh, for profit uh, making. And that the people might decide to go to war after gauging if the war brings a lot of benefit or the losses. And that whenever they realize that there's a lot of profit that comes from these wars, then it becomes so difficult to negotiate a peaceful resolution uh, because of the beneficiaries. Some scholars will call them spoilers. People who are benefiting from this and therefore they will not want peace because there is a lot of benefit that is coming uh, from this uh, conflict. So they weigh between the economic opportunities that come from that conflict and uh, if we had peace, are there economic opportunities? Are there profits? Then if they realize that the war brings more economic profit than a peaceful environment, then they opt to disrupt the peaceful negotiation because they want to benefit. Uh, they, they want the benefits uh, to flow. Uh, I want to somehow agree with these scholars because using the case of Mount Elgon, you see that there was a lot of economics going on, uh, profits making down there. In as much as Nairobi will hear that people are dying, people are being displaced, but nothing was covered to show who is benefiting and the trade uh, that was going on. But then my question will be, so was there profit making in SLDF led war? And if the answer is yes, who benefited and how? Who benefited uh, from this uh, conflict and how? And who also, who are the racketeers? Who are the racketeers? These are people who are making money. These are people who are making money. Although some scholars will say, in a dishonest way, or the dictionaries would say racketeers is making money in a dishonest way, but to them, that was the only way to make money. So who are these uh, people who are engaging in these activities and making uh, profit uh, from uh, this uh, conflict, uh, making profit uh, from this conflict? I say that if imperial evidence reveal, imperial evidence reveal that personal experiences of war might be deeply chaotic and bloody. Imperial evidence reveals that. If you look at, you take any uh, book on conflict, if you watch news, the pictures you see, imperial evidence prove that there is a chaotic and bloody uh, seen uh, during a uh, war. And this is what uh, scholars like Milton Leitenberg describes as scenes of death, that war is a scene of death or spaces of death. Killing fields. If you read the book, Me Against My Brother, then many people, uh, scholars who have written there, argue that we, there are brothers turning against brother, killing each other. It's just a chaotic scene, uh, according uh, to them. However, studies in conflict zones, 
have also proven that people make profit out of that blood. And this has been seen by researchers in Mozambique, where we had a, a, long, a long war, uh, areas like Sierra, Sri Lanka, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Those of you who are familiar with the blood diamond and everything. Uh, there's a lot of proof that people make a lot of profits uh, from that. And Sudan, uh, Somalia, people making a lot of profit. If you've been following, you know, the charcoal business and everything that goes on there, in as much as you see uh, the conflict, but under, down there, there is a lot of trade uh, that is going on. And this indicates that although war fractures society, there is always, uh, there is also an elusive and chartered landscapes that benefit many. Landscapes that benefit many, apart from the blood that we see behind uh, the cameras. And this is seen in the words of Caroline Nordstrom, who argues that much happens in the shadows of war. That much happens in the shadows uh, of war. And to her, this is a zone beginning at the age of official state order. This is the, the, what she calls the shadow is the region that begins at the age where the state's order stops. That there is a lot that happens uh, there. That in the heart of legal darkness, I'm calling it legal darkness because uh, it's a region that any time a government takes office, everybody expects that it's going to control its territories. It's going to secure citizens from all corners to make sure that the center holds the periphery. But in a situation where the government deliberately, deliberately fails to operate, this is what uh, Caroline is saying, that it is a shadow in the legal darkness because the government will have deliberately let that region without uh, control. And that there is a lot of business that goes on in this region where there is uh, no government. Uh, in fact, in front of cameras showing blood, according to her, blood in conflict zones and a hostile environment, there are behind those cameras, there is a thriving business that goes on. There is a thriving uh, business. And when we be mentioning the racketeers, people benefiting from this, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. There's a lot of business going down there. Uh, and that there is a series of shadow networks that goes on down there. It doesn't come to the before the cameras. That's why it is in the shadow. It's hidden down there. So what we see is the blood flowing. But behind that camera, in that shadow, there's a lot of business or networks that go on. Uh, on the coast of SLDF conflict, there was an undercover economy. There was an undercover economy that thrived so much, uh, that, that, that thrived so much. But this is not beginning with Mount Elgon. It has been part of the history of war around the world. It's not beginning. Mount Elgon is not the only region which experiences this. It is all over. And uh, profiteering in war is as old as war itself. So the first time the first war was fought, behind that war, there was a question of profiteering. So it's not a reserve of Mount Elgon. It happens all over. It, it happens uh, all over where there are uh, any uh, conflict. So it is as old as war itself. And that fighters, fighters who engage in war have a profit to make. 
they have a profit to make, fighters who engage uh, in war. And here I have in mind people who make a decision on why should we engage in war. They have a profit to make. Uh, I know you might be wondering, what about uh, the, the young soldiers who just perish on war? Uh, sometimes they don't have, the, the people who make the decision have a profit to make, and these ones are just collateral damage. They're dying in line of duty. So, uh, in any time a decision is made to engage in war, there is a profit behind it. And you'll agree that war industry is a classic example of profit making, the war industry. And anytime you see a war industry, then it is a business. It is a business. And you'll agree, no one can open a shop where there is no customer to purchase what you're coming to sell. So anytime you see a war industry, then there is profit behind it. People are making large profits to sustain that industry. To sustain that industry. And it does not just stop at that. Even if the conflict comes to an end, there are profiteers also who benefit from it in what we call post-war reconstruction post-war reconstruction. There's a lot of profit. You have seen NGOs uh, running projects here and there, uh, that peace campaigns and everything. There's a lot of benefit, economic benefits that uh, lead to profit uh, making. Uh, lead to profit uh, making. And as I said, although Mount Elgon conflict was triggered by the land question, but there, there, there is a lot of uh, benefit uh, that people are making down there. Actors in that conflict benefited in various ways. And I will just pick three uh, types of benefits or economy as discussed by Jonathan Goodlag, Goodhand on taxonomy of war, where he brings out uh, uh, different uh, types of economies that are uh, take place uh, during uh, conflict. Uh, there are three which he called combat economy, shadow economy, and coping economy. And coping economy. Now, under combat economy, for the Mount Elgon uh, case, uh, combat e economy, first of all, is an economy that funds the war effort. Is an economy that keeps that war moving. Is an economy that finances uh, that war. And main actors or beneficiaries range from one, the government of the day, the government of the day, and you'll be shocked. Why will? How will the government benefit? particularly in a, con a conflict like what we have, we had in Mount Elgon. So they range from the government of the day and the militia groups operating in the region or the actors, other actors uh, operating in the uh, region. Uh, for them to maintain that conflict, they must generate resources. They, they must generate uh, resources. And this can be generated through uh, predatory taxation, which happened in Mount Elgon, SLDF imposed taxes on the people. You have to pay each household for the soy family members, you are to pay because remember, it was about land defense force. We are defending your land, pay. If you don't have money, pay in terms of livestock, and other commodities that you can afford. Uh, so it, they can sustain this through predatory taxation, licit and illicit economic activities such as extortion, extortion of local businesses, imposing taxes on the local businesses, or exploitation of the natural resources among other means. This can be, if it is a forested area, 
Lake Mount Elgon, which is also a game reserve. Is there anything that you can benefit from this? Poaching will take place down there. Uh, lumbering will take place. Even when the government has a ban on Elgon teak and other indigenous species, then, but you'll find that at that time, there was a lot of destruction of the forest. And that will mean that uh, there, were, there was lumbering that was taking place down there. Uh, in Mount Elgon, the main profiteers in the combat economy were one, security apparatus, security uh, apparatus of the state, the security apparatus of the state. And you, must, uh, you might ask yourself, how? Yet they are supposed to uh, make sure that the region is safe. Uh, they are supposed to secure everyone, security apparatus. Now, how did the security apparatus benefit? Mount Elgon war placed Kenyan state to the path of war profit. It placed the Kenyan state uh, to the path of war profit. And one of the means in which it made a lot of profit, take it this way, purchasing of the ammunition, purchasing of the ammunition which was used, it needed uh, floating tenders, who wins the tender and who is supplying. So the government is at the center of that. And don't just look at uh, the ammunition. Those soldiers, those troops that are deployed there need basic commodities, food. Who is supplying? Who is supplying? Somebody is making profit from that conflict. Uh, somebody is making a kill, if I may borrow what my, my colleague Malim Justice uses. Somebody is making a kill from this, making profit from these tenders. That person might not be in Mount Elgon, might be Nairobi. Is in Nairobi, is the one making those deals. Supply food, you're getting this, and then supply to these troops. Down there, make a lot of profit. Uh, from it. And such people sometimes emerge to be cartels who are very powerful, who will not even want that peace to come in the region. Because that end of conflict means end of profiteering. End uh, of uh, pro profiteering. The contractors also benefit from this. They make a lot of wealth, uh, or they made a lot of wealth uh, from uh, the Mount Elgon uh, conflict. So in short, SLDF war was or became a means to achieve gains from the state uh, point of view. Now on the security agents, agencies, uh, research done by the arms uh, survey group of uh, Geneva, revealed that uh, many sites or evidence collected from sites of Mount Elgon indicate or strongly suggest that some of the ammunition which was used by members of the militia are, were assigned to the security agencies. They were assigned to the security agencies. How they were diverted to find themselves in the hands of militias, then that shows somebody was making profit from it. And that's why they were uh, diverted uh, all the way uh, to those militias. Now you may ask, what evidence is this? If you look at the cartridges that were collected or what was recovered, what was recovered from the sites Later on, when the military operated there, we'll find that some of those munitions, for example, we had, uh, I'm not an army man, so I don't, I'll, I'll just read, uh, say it the way. Uh, for example, the ammunition of caliber, caliber 7.62 times 51 mm, these ammunitions are produced by the Kenya 
ordnance factory in Eldoret. These ammunitions are produced by the Kenya Ordnance Factory. That means they are produced by the Kenyan military, the factory owned by the Kenyan military. How they found themselves in the hands of members of the militia is a big question there. Then that means somebody was trading in this uh, ammunition. Uh, some of these ammunitions are assigned to the police, to the Kenya police. And therefore, the Kenya, this placed the Kenya police at the center of profit making when it came uh, to this uh, conflict. Some of those police officers sold this ammunition to the members of the militia, uh, to the members of the militia. That's individuals within the police also acted privately to make profit uh, from uh, that conflict, uh, to make profit uh, from that conflict. Now, another group or another racketeer that was benefiting uh, from this conflict are business or conflict business inter entrepreneurs. These are arms traffickers. These are arms traffickers who could go all the way uh, to Sudan, go all the way to Uganda, purchase these weapons, and then come and sell them to the members uh, of the militia. Most of whom of, of these weapons crossed through Uganda into uh, the Mount Elgon uh, region. Uh, for the time the conflict went on, from 2004 to 2008, there was a lot of trade because the government had simply left the people on their own. So what was happening there is each militia was arming itself to keep afloat. And therefore there was a lot of weapons that were coming in, uh, that were coming in. Weapons were on high demand and this high demand created a supply chain created a supply chain, which ensured uh, that weapons are flowing all through into the Mount Elgon region. Now, if you look at the terrorized citizens and the blow back Kenya's illicit ammunition problem, then you'll find that there are routes that these weapons were moving in. They were, some of them originated as far as Somalia, entered, into the uh, northern part of Kenya, then we we'll go all the way. And, and Kano Kamenchu, in his book, The Terrorized Citizen, has detailed that. Some of these weapons came from Sudan, and they will come all the way into the Mount Elgon region. And some of them came crossed from Uganda. There was a lot of trade because of the porous border because of the porous uh, border. There was a lot of trafficking, particularly the entry points of Luahaha, Chebkube uh, in Bungoma. Uh, then you have entry points of Swam in Transoya and Amudat in West Pokot and Kiwawa in West Pokot. All these were transit points where the business entrepreneurs were actually coming in uh, with these uh, weapons and supplying uh, them to the militia. And they were making a lot of profit. For example, by the time the research was done, an AK-47 was going at between 10,000 and 20,000 shillings. 10,000 and 20,000 shillings. And it's not just that, there were several type of weapons that were flowing in uh, from uh, this region. If you look at the uh, blowback report, then you'll find that some of those weapons were coming all the way uh, from Eastern Europe. People are trading all the way from Eastern Europe into Sudan, into Kenya, uh, into uh, Kenya. And they, some of them are high caliber weapons. For example, a machine gun recovered by the military in Mount Elgon had a potential of firing 900 rounds 
in a minute. That will show that the Kenya police could not withstand the firepower. But where is this weapon coming from? Some of these weapons were coming from as far as Eastern Europe. And not just Eastern Europe, even in Western Europe, because some of the weapons recovered were of NATO standard, or they are used in Western Europe. How they will find themselves in Mount Elgon, it is because of these racketeers, this because of these business groups that were actually uh, uh, business entrepreneurs that were purchasing uh, or were bringing in uh, these weapons. Uh, another group that benefited were actually politicians, were politicians. Politicians benefited in two ways, trading in arms, as well as uh, mobilizing a people, giving them arms for the, uh, to vote for them. Uh, if I may quote uh, from the blowback report again, uh, you'll find that uh, the research indicated that at the beginning of February, a Kenyan government minister, that's in 2008, a Kenyan government minister traveled in company with divisional police officer and visited a town where they met young people and distributed guns and ammunition to them. Distributed guns and ammunition to them just before nightfall. And why was the minister doing this? To gain support, to benefit from the support. So it's not just uh, other entrepreneurs, also politicians are in it. Uh, uh, politicians are part of uh, the, the profiteers uh, from this uh, illicit trade of war. Uh, so political class benefited highly. Now that is the combat economy. But then the second type of economy that was happening in Mount Elgon is the shadow economy the shadow economy. This involves underground economy, which is invisible. Underground economy, which is invisible. Some scholars who have concentrated on economy of war will call it the ghost economy. You don't see it, but it's happening. It's happening down there. A scholar by the name Philip defines it is as unregistered economy. So it's nowhere, it's not detailed anywhere, but it's happening. And that's why we call it uh, the shadow economy. This type of economy thrives in a chaotic scenario. It thrives in a, cha a chaotic scenario or in ungoverned peripheral state, uh, spaces. So it thrives in spaces that are not governed, ungoverned spaces. There's a lot of shadow economy which goes on are uh, down there. Uh, and in this, it, it is in this shadow economy or the actors in the shadow economy are always, uh, will not support the question of peace because that will mean uh, their, their, their businesses will come to be known. And if they are known, then that means that they will not uh, be benefiting from this. This is an economy which is not new in Mount Elgon, the shadow economy is not new in Mount Elgon. It's not actually beginning with SLDF. It began long before. Uh, why am I saying long before? In 1970s, in 1960s, the smuggling of coffee in Chebkube went on. That is part of the shadow economy too. It's not registered, but there was a lot of smuggling. Chebkube, uh, when I visited there while collecting this data, I was shocked because there's nothing there but they tell you this is Cape Kube. This is where the whole economy was happening, but there's no single building there. Apart from a few meters away, uh, a few kilometers away where there is a trading center, but uh, on the river bank where the trade was happening, there's no building there. It's just a panya route. So it's not new in Mount Elgon. This economy 
had been going on for a very long time uh, throughout 1970s. If you read Suffering Without Bitterness, uh, the, the book which has details or speeches of President, the first president, Jomo Kenyatta, you would say, Nenda Magendo na ukishikwa, shauriyako. Nenda Magendo na ukishikwa, shauriyako. So you realize that this economy was happening, but then the government had left it, that you can do it, but so long as we do not arrest you. If we arrest you, you are on your own. And he goes on in that uh, book to say that kishika mwizi, mchape viboko 30, next day muongeze 25, 20, achilia ya ende. Kuna aja kweka jela. So it's not a new type of economy in Mount Elgon. Smuggling is part and parcel of uh, the, what happens on the borderline between uh, Mount Elgon, uh, between Kenya and Uganda. Uh, during the war, Mount Elgon became an open crime zone, an, an open crime zone. And that means the official government feared to go there. And it was a crime zone because there was illegal trade going on, free, free, and other mechanisms that were also employed by the actors in the conflict, which included kidnapping people, kidnapping people, and then demanding ransom uh, from them. All that went on for more than four years. Uh, in Mount Elgon. People made a lot of kill with a threat that we're going to kill your person if you do not give us this amount. If you don't pay, then we are going to uh, kill your person. Uh, we also had trade in commodities like firewood, firewood which flourished during that period. And as I said, trade in timber or that poaching went on in Mount Elgon, uh, went on in Mount Elgon for a very long time. Uh, so, as I mentioned this, you see that the people who are benefiting might not be just the, the, the small persons down there. And anytime the media covers, it brings on the four, the small persons down there. This is what it says, these people have been killed, but then, the racketeers behind the scenes are never said, are never said. And that happens in all scenarios of war and any scenario that those racketeers are benefiting. You don't even mention them. If you go to Latin America, you've seen the same. People don't mention, you know them, but you don't say. If you say sometimes, even the police cannot mention some of them. Uh, something happened in Mexico where uh, one of the drug dealer was arrested and uh, they, they gave, his followers gave a warning to the police that unless you release him, we will be killing three police officers daily. And that was happening. Then he was re released. So sometimes people know them, but they don't talk about them. Uh, they, they don't talk about them. Finally, we have the coping economy, uh, the coping economy. Under the coping economy, uh, scholars have argued that conflicts affect livelihood, people's livelihood. They hit at the core of what sustains their uh, economy. Uh, people, but then people in conflict zones, in most cases, they display resilience in order to survive. Because if you cannot live, then you have just to cope around there display resilience for you to survive. In what uh, Paul Collier calls doing well out of conflict, doing well uh, out of uh, conflict. SLDF destroyed a lot of livelihood. We all agree. Farms were deserted. Mount Elgon is the food basket of Western Kenya and farms were deserted. People were ejected from those farms. People were ejected uh, from those farms. But 
Did all of them die? They had to cope and survive. They had to cope uh, and survive. Uh, to cope, the population in Mount Elgon uh, adopted a strategy of engaging in what uh, some scholars will call petty trade, uh, small trade down there uh, in order to get something to uh, survive on. And this included cross-border smuggling, cross-border smuggling. If you've been to the border with, between uh, of Kenya and Uganda, you realize that in most cases, goods are cheaper in Uganda than in Kenya. So if you smuggle from Uganda to Kenya, you know, you get a lot of, you make a lot of profit. So there's a lot of cross-border uh, smuggling that went on. Uh, and th th that's now people managing to survive, coping with the situation, there's conflict, but then even these soldiers who are fighting, even the militia members of the militia groups will need beer, for example, which is cheaper in Uganda. So cross, buy, come and sell. Come and sell. And if you go there right now, you'll see the same is still, they seem to have adopted it and it's an, uh, the government has been unable to stop it now. It's now still going on. People trading, uh, crossing, buying uh, grains from Uganda. They just cross the river, not using the main entry where KRA is. And one interesting thing, you realize that the Kenyan border on the Kenyan side is poorly manned. Some entry points you will find Ugandan security personnel and nobody on Kenyan side. Nobody on Kenyan side. So uh, they will adopt smuggling of goods uh, from Uganda and uh, into uh, Kenya. Uh, finally, I must say that in as much as we had racketeers benefiting from this conflict in Mount Elgon, we must acknowledge that over 25 countries that produce weapons benefited from this conflict. And they are still benefiting from conflicts that go on in Africa. Not just Kenya, Kenya is not in seclusion. These weapons are coming in from so many countries and finding themselves in the troubled territories and ungoverned territories of Kenya. Thank you very much. Wow. David, I didn't know you were pro West in Kiswahili uh, until uh, this afternoon. Enda Magendo, now Kishikwa Shauriako. We need to explore that uh, more. That uh, sounds like. Um, very interesting language of uh, uh, First President Muse Kenyatta. Uh, markets of uh, war. Uh, fascinating discussion that we have had from Masika. And um, actually very well attended, 61 people online and 35 on site. That's, that's quite good. That sh shows you the interest that people have in the kind of uh, study that you have involved yourself in in, in the past five uh, five years. Now, before I give a chance to uh, the audience here and the one online for questions and observations, uh, let me say that um, in, in, in way of uh, discussion, that um, taking a clue from you know, your previous presentation in, in another series that we had uh, where you were talking about, uh, uh, you know, the state 
and its innate influence in funding, uh, funding land conflicts. You, you have given us uh, a picture of um, interest about uh, you know, contestation uh, that uh, pitted the soy and the maso clans uh, you know, uh, over uh, 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 you, you know, what you're calling the Jebuk settlement three. And um, you, you, you seem to suggest that um, the, the, the state uh, didn't seem to handle the situation in ways that were geared towards uh, 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 creating uh, uh, peace and stability in, in, in the Mount Telugon. And, and in advancing uh, you know, uh, that kind of argument, um, you, you, you said three things, if I had you correctly. Uh, one, of course, um, you, you seem to bemoan the challenged hegemony of the state's uh, civil security institutions in the face of the resurgency of non-state actors. And, and, and I find this interesting because it, it, it dovetails into very well-known uh, arguments uh, about the, 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 the decline of uh, the state hegemony uh, in uh, Africa's post-colony uh, when you compare it with its colonial uh, predecessor, that uh, the African post-colonial state's uh, hegemony uh, declined uh, partially because it shared power with non-state actors, uh, you know, militia groups in your case. Uh, elsewhere, you talk of warlords. Uh, elsewhere, you talk of non-governmental uh, organizations and, and, and name it. That, that, that is uh, one of the very first points that you seem to, uh, to, to make. The, the second one, uh, you then advance that and argue that um, the non-state actors took advantage of uh, the state weakness uh, to commodify uh, the, the war in Mount Elegon, to, to literally create uh, uh, a war economy in what you see as um, ungoverned species. And, and you seem to suggest that this is uh, not only common in, in, in Kenya, in Mount Elegon, uh, but it's a characteristic that cuts across a number of countries uh, in Africa that have been bedeviled by uh, conflicts and, and, and in instability. And, and herein, that is in the commodification of, of war, then lies the intractable nature of uh, the Mount Telegon uh, uh, conflict in, 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 your, in your view. The, the last one, and, and this is very interesting, uh, you seem to, uh, to me to say that war is business. Biashara. In whichever way you, you, you look at it, in, in, in the very interesting typologies that you have given us from compo, uh, compact economy, shadow economy, and coping economy, you overly see war as, uh, as, as, as a business. And, and you seem to suggest that um, away from the sounds of guns and battle tanks in, 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 in the theater of war, there is a very interesting nexus which produces uh, what you very interestingly call a war industry. You know, a, a war uh, industry. And, and you seem to have a view that um, uh, th this does not end with the end of war, uh, but even post-war reconstruction in, in many parts of the continent, even uh, not least Mount Elgon, um, actually, this kind of business uh, uh, seems to be uh, perpetual. And, uh, you know, you create a portrait of um, a hidden theater of war in which there is a very extensive economy in which a few elements 
uh, you know, benefit, including uh, uh, state actors, uh, you know, state officials and, 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 and all that. That, that. that is very interesting. Um, but um, uh, David, I, when I look cross-sectionally from your discussion from the beginning, and I have the privilege of having read the chapter where you discussed this in, in, in your thesis, uh, the first part of it, where you talk about the minimalist state in, in, in Africa, uh, re resonates very well with uh, uh, a very well-known argument, as I said earlier, particularly if you read uh, Achille Mbembe's post-colony, uh, where he, he seems to compare uh, the colonial and the post-colonial state and says the post-colonial state in Africa is uh, fairly weak, uh, because uh, there are so many actors competing for uh, uh, the instruments of po uh, for force and, and violence uh, in, 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 in its environment. And, and in the second section of your presentation, uh, you, you seem to lean more uh, to uh, what uh, uh, some uh, uh, scholars have called instrumentalization of disorder. Uh, there is a book uh, we always talk about, Africa Works, uh, 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 by Dalosi and uh, uh, Francois Bayer, instrumentalization of, of disorder in, in Africa. That um, when you look at uh, 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 very clearly, uh, there is some kind of uh, order in the disorder that is war that produces a very profitable uh, 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 process, uh, which uh, every actor within the war uh, would want to, uh, uh, to, to perpetuate. Uh, and therefore violence in the, in, the, in the African continent is a deliberate move uh, that benefits uh, certain actors, particularly uh, the political elite. If you agree with me that uh, what you have told us resonates very well with these um, already known uh, uh, trajectories of intellectual discourse, then my very simple question will be, what is novel in what you have been saying this afternoon? What is new? Uh, what is your contribution in the understanding of the political economy of Mount Elegon Wars? I, I will leave it there. We can continue the debate uh, because we are still together. And now open it up for the uh, on-site audience. Uh, please, if you have a question, uh, raise up your hands. And uh, I see quite a few interests. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Gona, Dr. Nyanchoga, uh, Malimu Wafula, Professor Wahome, uh, Professor Nzioka, and uh, Malim Mungesa, and Malim uh, Tabita. And uh, I seem not to have your name, but you in that order, please. Very quickly, make it simple. There's a lot of interest in this. Yes, Dr. Gona. Thanks, thanks, Kenneth. Thanks uh, for giving me a chance to ask a few questions. Um, one, one first one, a bit, uh, you, you kept on referring to down there, right? Which is this down there? I, I, I think you could, you could explain that. Okay, um, three quick ones. Um, what, what makes the shadow economy of Mount Elgon different from what was happening during the Magendo time? Because you, you, you refer to illegal business existing Mount Elgon before uh, before the Mount Elgon War. So what, what makes, maybe that resonates with uh, Dr. Mbogi's uh, question of what, what is novel about your, uh, your discussion? Um, a, a very pertinent question that I want you to address is, is economic motivation the only, uh, only thing that uh, people at war engage, people are engaged in war uh, go for? Are there other reasons why people engage in war other than economic motivation? And then lastly, and this is uh, uh, the problem with the framing of, uh, uh, of your paper, 
your paper is titled uh, Marketeers and then Profiteers. And marketeers and profiteers are basically the shadow economy. But later you bring in the combat economy. So you seem to be conflating combat economy and shadow economy. And a subsidiary question, what is the motivation of the three uh, people who participate in the combat economy and those who participate in the shadow economy and the coping economy, what is their motivation to seek peace and not continue war? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please hand over. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Nyanchoga. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, thanks, um, Masika David, for that good presentation. I only have uh, one question or two. Uh, I came in a bit late, and uh, when I sat down, you were talking about uh, atrocities, uh, which are usually meted on people, and specifically in this region uh, of your study, where you did say clearly that uh, this happens where there is minimal or absence of government on the ground. And at some point, you also talk of uh, government of the day. Uh, so I found some. Uh, contradiction in your argument because uh, you seem to suggest at some point that government could be involved uh, perhaps in the shadows uh, in this conflict and at some point you also say uh, that this was happening because of minimal government presence so uh, i'm at loss actually because uh, i was wondering uh, then uh, what are you talking about uh, then secondly I think to reinforce what I'm talking about, you did talk of uh, Mount Ergon as a game reserve. Uh, when you talk of a game reserve, I tend to uh, agree with you that uh, there is government presence in this region. Uh, therefore, I think as much as you talk of absence of government, you are again strongly talking of government presence at the same time. Thank you very much. Okay, Walim uh, Wafula, Gilbert. Thank you very much. Walimu David Masika uh, for that enlightening presentation, especially for some of us who are not professional historians. I've learned a lot, quite a lot, as somebody who comes from around that place. Uh, one question, but maybe another one will just be for you to make a comment. The question is uh, about the proximity of um, Mount Elgon to Kerio Valley where there have been some fighting for some time. Do you think some of these people who may have participated in this kind of transactions, business transactions, could be the same? Is there a link between the two? Uh, the second question is uh, just a comment, uh, by the way, sort of because it may not relate directly to your research, given that it's about yours is about post-colony, but this area, Mount Elgon, has been experiencing a lot of activities, historical activities, cultural activities for a long time, since prehistory. Uh, during your research, for example, Mount Elgon is known to have very many caves uh, whereby people have been hiding, using them for, for, for example, hiding, do you think they could have been those caves could have been used to hide arms? Uh, then, uh, during your research, is it possible that uh, you could uh, have encountered any sites? Because given that Mount Elgon, on the Ugandan side, just across the border, our brothers in Uganda have used the cultural heritage of the place. Now they have a museum known as the History and Cultural Museum, Mount, Mount Elgon History and Cultural Museum, whereby they are now showcasing the cultural heritage of the people of the area. On, the, on our side, we don't have such a, a thing, yet we have several cultural heritage sites, for example, some of our colleagues at the museum have been doing research there. One of our former students known as Manuel Diema, an archeologist from this department, 
has conducted a research with the purity cura in Mount Elgon, and they have discovered sites. There's one known as Chep Nalil Cave, dated to about 23,000 BP. And another one known as Kakapel Monument Rock Shelter, which has a lot of uh, drawings, art, about the occupants of that place, going back for a long time. Just a comment, what can you say about the cultural heritage of that place? Given that in your comment, you say that uh, one of the reasons this uh, problem has been there is that uh, it's a problem of, uh, of uh, people looking for resources. What can you say? Thank you. Thank you, Mwili Mwafula. Uh, Professor Waome. Uh, Professor Waome is our immediate and former Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have two questions. One is on this phase three. Uh, you mentioned mismanagement, and I think it is more of a competition of resources. Uh, but uh, I would like you to compare the, the three. Just show us where this mismanagement is coming in. Then uh, there's the issue of uh, benefits, economic benefits of war. I, I don't think the majority were benefiting. So there was probably uh, urgency for peace. Probably you could, uh, again, list uh, your theory. You could look at that issue and uh, probably make a comment. Thank you. Uh, Professor Nsioka. Uh, Professor Nsioka is the immediate former chair of the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and African Studies. African, uh, women. African women, yes. Uh, thank you, Prof, uh, for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm a bit late, uh, but I just wanted to ask a very general question. What, uh, David, what, how do you think the experiences of Mount Elgon can help us to understand what is happening in the Rift Valley, in the North Rift? Because in a way, there are, there are similarities, and that's why I came here to, to hear that. Thanks. That is very interesting, David. There you are. We, we will be having another presentation by another student talking about the Rift Valley. Uh, I think uh, uh, the second after the next week one. Uh, yes, Mali Um, Thank you very much, um, Mali Masika, for that very good presentation. I have um, just a few comments maybe questions or not. Uh, first, I want to understand why throughout the four years, how do we interpret government silence throughout this period that uh, the racketeers and marketeers are very busy doing business? Um, the other question is um, very brief also. When we think of this war economy and looking at it from the beneficiaries that we call security men, could this be an extension of our culture of corruption that went into war? And lastly, this war economy, if um, we take it from your point of view, then it enriched many people far and wide. Did you try by any chance to look at the, some of the companies, some of the actual sources of either funding or arms and ammunition that you can actually put a finger on a company in Uganda or in Europe or somewhere that actually this group of people gained from this war. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Mali Mungesa. There was, uh, I think he's a student there. Uh, please uh, tell us your name and uh, uh, 
uh, here, here. Uh, yeah, as uh, the student talks, uh, uh, you know, Masika and I, we were taught by Malimungesa at different times, uh, so that we, we are intellectual cousins. Uh, yes. Good afternoon. My name is Sheila Ngei. Uh, thank you, Dr. Masika, David Masika. Uh, he yeah, was put the microphone closer to your mouth. Yeah, my name is Sheila Ngei, and Mr. Masika has been teaching me last semester. My question is, do you have any insight into why Kenya and other African countries do not openly go into weapon making as an economic activity? That's a good one. David, you can see the interest. Please respond uh, very precisely. Then uh, we can go online. Our online audience, please uh, keep writing your questions uh, on the chat and we will raise them up uh, uh, once he responds to the ones that have been uh, raised by the on-site audience. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the questions that you posed. Uh, I will start with the question I think it, the, the one that was posed by Dr. Gona, which is closely related with the, the what, what the chair was raising, what makes shadow economy different uh, from Magendo, the, the Chip Kube Magendo and everything. Uh, there is a big difference there. The Chip Kube one wasn't um, uh, armed violent. It was smuggling, sort of smuggling, but people were making a lot of a kill. And as much as weapons were also being traded, but the conflict did not come up in the open the way it did uh, in uh, during the SLDF, which was literally informed by the land uh, question. Uh, Dr. you also asked uh, his economic motivation the only cause of war? No. There are other reasons. Economic, uh, it's, it's sort of, some of them adopt an economy to survive in war. But when you look at it uh, from the Mount Elgon point of view, it is because of mismanagement of the land question. And I'm saying mismanagement of the land question, which goes uh, to what Professor Homer was asking about. I call it mismanagement because the history of the region, uh, in 1967, the government gazetted Chepkitale region as the water tower, and then moved the people out. When they moved the people out of this region, they created Chepuk settlement phase one, which went on very well. Uh, and then uh, people, it did not take care of everyone who was affected. So the government created Chebuk settlement phase two. That one went on well. But now the problem came in phase three because in phase three, people, uh, as the government hived the, the region, the soil did not, the Mosop were not enough to constitute a settlement scheme. So they brought in the Mosop uh, and other communities who now uh, were shareholders in phase three. Now, immediately after allocation, some of the Mosop sold their land and went back to the forest. The government went for them and evicted them from the forest. Now, when they were evicted, they came back to claim what they had sold. Now that's when the provincial administration came in, particularly during the reign of PC Francis Lekolo and DC Mangera. Uh, those two provincial administrators, instead of listening to the grievances of the people, they simply uh, canceled the whole process. And said, now no one has land in phase three. What happens is uh, we will start issuing land afresh in this phase. There was a lot of grievance. A delegation was made to visit President Moy uh, and uh, to deal with the issue. Now, the people also felt, or, or uh, they felt that President Moy will offer a solution. But then PC Lekolol felt that the people had 
reported him to the president. And so he even reduced the number of acres that people were to be given. The people knew that they were to get uh, 50 acres per household, but now he reduced it to one acre, uh, to five acres, then later on two acres. So the people felt that no. And then DC Mangera would say, okay, now as I cancel this, you will get the plot through balloting. That is where now the soy refused to go through the process and say, we are not going to get anything here and decided that we are going now to buy guns and deal with it through arm, arm confrontation. So there's an element of mismanagement, not competition, because the competition will have also been felt in phase one and two. But then here, there was a lot of uh, mismanagement. Uh, Dr. Gona also asked combat economy and shadow economy, what is their motivation to seek peace and not war? That's a little bit, uh, that, that, that's a little bit uh, tricky. But then when you look at combat economy, where, where we have the state machinery involved, you will realize that when there is an outcry by the people, then the government sometimes decides that now we want peace. Just like there is an outcry in Kerio Valley, the way Professor Nzioka has asked it, that everybody's saying, why, why, why banditry, banditry, then the government pretends to be running there. So the government responds as a reaction to the outcry, and that might have motivated the uh, uh, them to seek uh, the question of uh, peace. Now, Dr. Nyanjoga asked, that there's a contradiction between minimal and absence of the state, but then I talk about some state uh, agencies. Basically, when you are dealing with domestic issues, it is the question of the government. In Mount Elgon, when the conflict began, the government institutions were ejected from the region because SLDF did not just target the MOSOP. It also targeted teachers, schools, chiefs. Actually, most of the chiefs took refuge as far as Kakamega. They ran away. The region was a no-go zone for government agencies, including the police stations. Actually, police were more casualties because they were ejected, killed, and everything. Now, that is when the, uh, the, the government of the day and uh, Dr. Gona has been cautioning me about that, and you also said it. That's when the government felt that it cannot manage that conflict and therefore sanctioned the state machinery, which is the military, the arm of the state. And how did it sanction the state machinery? It uh, built its case that the uh, Kenyan state is at a threat from the periphery. So we want to instill order. And that's when the military was deployed as an agent of the state because the government institutions had been ejected and failed uh, to deal with the question. Now, Professor asked, how do we relate that with the case in uh, the, the Rift Valley and Malimo Afula also uh, said, uh, was asking whether there is a link uh, between the two. I will, on the link, let me borrow from what happened uh, during the Murukutua massacre. Murukutua massacre is a massacre that took place in Chesongoj. Chesongoj is deep into the Kerio Valley. Uh, there was raid and counter raids between the Pokot and the Marakwet. Now, one time the Pokot came to water their animals on the Kerio River. The Marakwet rounded those animals and they knew that the Pokot will come for them. So what did they do? They sold them. And those animals were sold as far as Kimilili market and Bungoma. They were sold all the way down. It's not, the region is not far. Now, this is when the Pokot realized that they will not get back their animals. So when they came, they wanted to punish the Marakwet. And that's when they staged the famous Murukutua massacre, flattening the entire Murukutua location. 
And as they were retreating, they passed through Endo Clinic where they found uh, the doctors who were vaccinating the children against polio, they decided to vaccinate them with bullets as they retreated back to Koloa. Again, if you look at the racketeers, people who are benefiting in this trade of arms are actually uh, selling those weapons. Remember I said, if you look at uh, Colonel Kamenchu and uh, the Bevan report on arms proliferation, you'll see that some of these weapons are coming as far as Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan. So they are passing through those. The traders are making, uh, if I use Malim Jasta's words, a kill in all those territories. The same, they are supplying from uh, those uh, all those regions. So generally, there is that link between those regions. And the belt is, it does not just end there. It starts from Laikipia, all into the belt of uh, uh, Suguta Valley, Kerio Valley, all the way to Uganda, into Karapokot region. The, the whole region is troubled. Very close to Transoya, by the way, to Kitale town. There's a big forest and some of those animals are taken through the forest to Uganda. So there's a lot of trade in between uh, those uh, region. Uh, you also ask it whether we have some cultural or sites uh, in the region. Yes, we do. Apart from the caves that you mentioned, there are several forts in the region. Now, the forts now bring in a conflict between the Sabaot and the Bukusu, because the Bukusu mm -hmm. argued that forts were constructed by huh? Bantus, the Bukusus, not Kalenjins. And therefore, they used those forts as a mark of their territory. And if you go to Cheptais, for example, where there is Chonge Fort, you will realize that the Bukusus still sing to this day when they, were, they are circumcising the children, that the Chonge fort must be recovered. And that we, it is not yet over until Chonge fort is back. But Chonge fort, the remnants are actually within uh, the territories occupied by the Sabaot. That does not stop there. The Mutama fort on Mount, the other side of Mount Elgon still is on the region where the, in the region where the Sabaot claim. But the Bukusu say, the Sabaots were not building forts. Forts belong to the Bukusus, so that is our land. So that's the contest of the issue of land. Um, my teacher, Madam Pamela, is asking, why the silence of four years? I think the government just decided uh, that there was a lot of politics in those four years. First of all, uh, we have people, the, 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 uh, the, the Kibaki Uhuru elections in 2002, people thought that, look here, the government is going to solve this. It did not do that. Then uh, the war erupts. The people of Chepuk say, we, we must make the government aware that there is a problem here. The government is silent about it. Actually, in fact, the government will not have gone there if not, Mama Lucy Kibaki went there and found women with no ears uh, because SLDF adopted a policy of chopping off ears and lips. So if you are speaking about it, they chopped off the lips. If you listened, you lost your ears because of listening. And sometimes if you wrote an you entered into an agreement with them that I'll give you my livestock because I don't have a child to, to serve in your militia, then they will cut a, a square on your ear as a mark of the covenant. So when Mama Lucy went there and saw the, all this and said, and we have a government. Remember, she even threatened to storm Professor George Saitoti's office. And that is when what provoked the government now to authorize Operation Koa Maisha. Otherwise, maybe it will still be going on. Uh, it, it will still uh, be going on. So uh, in Rift Valley, the problem is still the same. But then uh, can the Mount Elgon approach serve in Kerio Valley, for example? The answer is no. 
The military succeeded in Mount Elgon because these militias had a rank, had a command chain. They had the whole formation. In Kerio Valley, there are no formations. So who are you looking for in Kerio Valley? You can't get anybody. Now, the only solution to Kerio Valley, for those who have gone there, it's good that I did my master's, my MA on the same Kerio Valley. Uh, the troubled region is from Tunyo, Mogil, Chesongoch, Endo, and Chesoy. This is just a stretch because uh, the, the, it's a border between the Kerio River is a border between the Maraquit, Maraquit and uh, the Pokot in East Baringo. So what brings them to conflict is actually water and livestock. Now, how can we stop that? It's very easy, by the way, to end that conflict. It's very easy. Construct a dam at Chesoy. And the terrain is so good, like the, it is just resembles the one in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia. Once you construct a dam at Chesoy, the dam will hold water all the way to Tunyo on the bridge to Tungulu Bay. And this other side, the Keios don't fight with the Tugen. They have, uh, they, culturally they don't. In fact, they say, if a Keio crosses to steal livestock from the Tugen, then he will not cross the river. He will die. So they don't. Keios and Tugen don't fight over that. Now this dam will hold water and it will become a natural barrier between the two communities. Now that will then give the government a, a way of irrigating, just irrigate territories on both sides. People will settle and there's no way Pokots will move from Koloa to come and cross the plantations into the Maraquit territory. If they did that, they will solve that conflict within a, a very short time because no livestock will cross the river if the, it's a dam and they can do that. We have the 12th engineer, the engineering battalion in the military. We have uh, the national youth service. They can do that work within a very short time. But I think there is no political goodwill. What we do is a show, a show just to parade around uh, like when, uh, and we borrowed this from President Moy when a lorry was taken by Somali fighters, then Moy gave an ultimatum that returned that lorry within 24 hours. Then the military was ordered to fly over Somalia. The lorry was returned. So we believe that if we flog the military down there with the, and say boots on the ground, marching here and there, the conflict will end. I strongly believe it's not the best approach. You get that. Um... I hope they are listening, uh, those who are concerned. Uh, we, we have discussed this with David uh, uh, quite a lot. Uh, the SDRF was very structured with uh, General uh, Wycliffe Kirui Matoke at the top and his deputy Terminator. Uh, so the command structure was known, so you go for him. And that's why when the military killed him, uh, they put his body uh, in a parade for the public to, to view so that they know that he has died. And when Wycliffe died, actually uh, the war ended. But in the Rift Valley, uh, it's a faceless enemy. Who are you following? Who is commanding who? Anyway, um, I, I know, Malim Tabita, you had a question. Just hang on to it. We go online and then we'll come back to you, please. Um, our online audience, I can see a, a couple of questions on the chart. Uh, please go to the beginning. Uh, go to the beginning. Uh, I, I'll read uh, uh, a couple of these questions, and then I will invite those who want to ask their questions much more directly. Um, the, the first one, uh, David, is from uh, uh, somebody called Edwin uh, Manimu. Uh, he says, uh, thanks, Mr. Masika, for the incredible presentation, more explorative and interrogative. You argue that econopolitical networks took their center stage in harnessing massive profits in Mount Elgon. The theme is more challenging. Who were the racketeers, 
yet you argue that the prophets, uh, the profiteers, uh, blackmailers, uh, and merchants benefited immensely from war profits. Is it that they racketeered the markets of war to benefit financially from the massive profits? Uh, it, it is like you have left us to interrogate the topic and establish specifically who were the racketeers of war. Question two, from my own uh, knowledge, that is Edwin saying, of the bandit economy, I could argue that the racketeers were the overtly armed militarized groups who engaged in racketeering ethnic and political violence. Uh, forced defections and attack on some security operators uh, for their own interests. How could you analyze this, Mr. Masika? Uh, let's go to the next one. And uh, let's move, uh, move down, please. Let's move. Yeah, the second one uh, is uh, our own senior colleague, Professor Smiu Wandiba, who is saying profiteering just in economic form or also in other forms. Uh, then uh, there is uh, Abu Bakr Farah. Uh, what were the key factors that allowed these markets to thrive? And what steps can be taken to prevent uh, similar markets from emerging in future? Um, there's somebody who has written here in a language I cannot read. Uh, so let's proceed. Uh, uh, let's proceed. The others are just compliments. Many of them are compliments. Uh, there is a question here from Samuel uh, Moyeko. Uh, this is wonderful. Talking of behind the cameras, this has been seen in most cases in conflicting areas. Currently, the same is evident in the North Rift. It has come to, it has come to the attention uh, to our attention maybe that some politicians are in support of the bandits. During Natembea's time, some were mentioned, but later on set free. And in the ongoing disarmament process, we have some leaders mentioned. One MP being questioned by DCI team. Your presentation has covered a lot. That's a comment. Um, yes, yes. Um, there is uh, Karan Charles. Good presentation, however, war is everywhere or in some places. That's a question. How can a few individual criminal actions become the state actions? And it is uh, there's something that is not clear there. Uh, it is probably, if I read it well generally, is just trying to ask uh, if there was one individual or a state officer who uh, messed up, how do you generalize that to the rest? Um, let me see. Um, uh, there is uh, Tom Odiambo, our colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Odiambo uh, from literature, says, thanks, David, for revisiting this subject, which is quite relevant today. I could want to hear you speak more to the question of local myths about war warriors of the community and the sustenance of El uh, uh, about Land Defense Force. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, Professor Simi Wandiba uh, is back uh, again. Uh, Mount Heligon is not a game reserve, but a national park. That's for information. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, there is uh, Wilson Vitengo. Uh, thanks, Masik, uh, Mr. Masika. I have two questions. One, uh, was there a genuine concern about the Mount Elgon War? Uh, it doesn't specify from who, maybe from the state. Uh, what are the similarities and differences between the bandit economy and the Mount Elgon War? Uh, Professor Wandiba, back uh, again. Uh, what could you have to say about the allegations that the Sabaut Land Defense Force was using arrows imported from Korea by a Sabaut working and living in Nairobi. Uh, a very important international dimension of this uh, local war. Then uh, there is one whiter. Malim, at the start you said that all this was started due to land disputes. And later on, you argue in a way 
that the war was started by the racketeers for their uh, profit. Kindly talk about it. You get that? The, the difference there? Also, what other benefits were there? Uh, you have lost me there. Oh, you have taken that. Uh, uh, what? And uh, what other benefits were there apart from the economic ones? Uh, and then there is uh, Lokanyang, uh, Lokanyangyo Stephen Meshake. Uh, he can, the country's GDP depend on ghost economy. That's an interesting one. Uh, then we have Brian Kefa, uh, a student of political science and philosophy, and I'm interested in security more, so civil war. Thank you for your wisdom, but I think we need to review pre-colonial mapping when dealing with such conflict in our time. Uh, I don't know what exactly that means. How do you then explain if the war is culturally motivated? Uh, let's go. Uh, that's a nice comment. Uh, that's a compliment there. Then there is uh, Sheila Ngei. Uh, thank you for the resourceful pro uh, presentation. What prevents African countries from openly manufacturing weapons? Could it be the narrative that being African is being polite, kind, and wise? Same question like what uh, uh, our student here asked. Uh, now let's go to the online audience, please, uh, so that we see. I did respond to that first briefly. Uh, 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 well, okay, fine. Uh, uh, Mr. Masika is saying he wants to respond to that. So those who wanted to ask your questions directly, please hang on. I can see a number of you, including Malimuanyoika. We will come back. Just hang on. We'll come back, please, in a very precise way. There is a lot of interest in this. Uh. I'll start by looking, uh, first of all, acknowledging the slight correction done by Professor Wandiba. Uh, yes, it's a national park. Uh, it's not a game reserve, it's a national park. Uh, then uh, Samuel, Mr. Samuel was asking if there, in, how do we take one individual, maybe as MEST, we take, a, we cite one individual, let's say from the security agencies, and baptize the crime to all uh, the, the, the state agencies. I, I want to state that one individual cannot militarize a region. It must be a system. One individual cannot do that. One police officer cannot militarize an entire region unless he owns a company of trade, which is supplying those weapons. But then, even if he owned that company, what are other security agencies like the national intelligence doing? Because they're supposed to spot that. So they must be in it. In it. When I was preparing to come and do this presentation, uh, there's a case, a ruling which was done in the United States yesterday of a, a, a senior security chief from Mexico who was fighting drugs. And then he is now, they have arrested him as the main trader in drugs. But he, he was known all over Latin America and North America as the only ruthless officer fighting against drugs. So unless it is such a situation where one very influential officer is doing this, but then where are the other security agencies? then they are also compromised. And therefore, uh, it becomes an entire uh, system. On the question of local myths about warriors, if they have, uh, they contributed to that conflict, a very good uh, question. If you go to the Bukusus, when they circumcise their young people, they sing praising the warriors who fought was with the Sabaot, who fought was with the Sabaot. But then when you come to this conflict, these are people who speak the same language. These are people who share the same culture. What divides them is actually the clan affiliation. That we have some clans who are aligned to the soy 
and the one others aligned to the mosop. And even the mosop and the soy is just a, a creation. Soy means those who are settled at the lower side of the Mount Elgon and mosop at the Moor land. But they speak the same language. Their culture is, actually you cannot differentiate them if you met them. They, they, they are the same, same people. So generally the role of warriors here, it will have worked so well, uh, my senior, if it, it was a conflict between the Bukusu and the Sabaot. It will have come out uh, very uh, clear. Somebody asked a question about uh, manufacturing of our own weapons, which goes in hand with uh, our students here. I gave an example. We also manufacture weapons. We manufacture ammunition. And some of those ammunitions that we manufacture are part of the problem in the region. For example, uh, the ones manufactured in uh, Kenya ordnance factory in Eldridge, which are meant to be used for our own military and security agencies, also found themselves in the hands of the militias. Who took them there? That's when I, so we also manufacture. Some of the weapons also are manufactured in Uganda, Sudan, that found themselves. It's only that I didn't read, but I have examples here of all those weapons that are manufactured in Sudan, some in Uganda, ammunition from the Kenya uh, Ordnance Factory. They all found themselves there and they have labels. So you, you're not going to say uh, this, this coming from another country. They have labels, the factory labels, uh, and yet they found themselves there. So we are also manufacturing, but then taking me to what my teacher, Madam Pamela was saying, is this part of our culture of corruption? then it's true corruption might be playing. And I always say that for every bullet or every gun in the wrong hand that kills an innocent person, there is a corrupt officer behind it, behind the camera. Because how did it move uh, to those areas? How? How? Uh, sometimes back, Journalists went all the way to Lokchogyo. They bought three guns, placed them behind a car, the, the hind seat of the car, then drove all the way from Lokchogyo through Kitale, through Eldoret, through Nakuru, through Naivasha, and they passed more than 20 roadblocks. The police officers were inspecting the driver, not what the vehicle was carrying. <laughs> and they handed the guns to a central police station. And you know where they were inspecting the drive. Yeah. Uh, well, there was a time when uh, I, I think the car was still in uh, Utali. A vehicle rolled just past Utali gate carrying marijuana, splitting it all over the highway, but it had traveled all the way from Mount Kenya, passing roadblocks. Then everything that you see, as my teacher said, corruption is a major contributor to all this uh, mess. Um, so we manufacture those weapons. And again, through our corrupt nature, they end up uh, finding themselves too. Now, uh, somebody said Rekitia, the difference, I didn't really get the question so well, but um, racketeering is actually making wealth in the illegal way. You're just making wealth in the illegal way. And that goes hand in hand with somebody who's asking that, can the ghost economy sustain the GDP? No. If it is ghost economy, it's a shadow economy, no one, unless that money finds itself in our banks and then uh, we loan we take loans from the banks to develop, but generally it is in the shadow. So uh, no, it, there's no record, uh, there's no record. And the high probability is that it's not fully taxed. So if it is not fully taxed, then it cannot assist to grow the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, uh, it was, uh, I hope she was misquoted, our Auditor General who said, uh, uh, we invest money of corruption within the country. I don't know how workable that is. Uh, let, let, let's go online. Uh, 
for a few questions. Um, let, let, let's begin with uh, Mary Wanyoike, uh, Professor Wandiba, uh, and uh, Vitengo, and Kinuthia in that order. Let's begin with uh, Mary Wanyoike, and then Professor Wandiba next. And mute yourself and ask your questions, Mali. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Masika, for that very interesting and revealing paper presentation. Uh, I get the impression that this was an economic, an economic based war, uh, both in causes and conduct. And uh, I have uh, followed the discussion, especially on the kind of economy that was there, the shadow economy, the coping economy, and all that. Now, my interest is in the livelihoods of the rest of the population that was not involved in the racketeering, in the marketeering, and in the smuggling. Because certainly, for you to get involved in racketeering and marketeering and smuggling, you must have some substantial capital and some sub substantial backing from elsewhere to get involved. How about the rest of the population? The ordinary man and woman, how was his or her livelihood affected by this war? Thank you. Uh, Professor Wandiba, please uh, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman. And thank you, David, for the presentation, which raised a very important issue. Um, I have um, just a few comments. When I was looking at the title and uh, throughout your talk, I didn't see come across an archaeological knowledge that you are reevaluating. So where did it go to? The archaeological knowledge that you are reevaluating. Two, I was wondering. If you just talked about the political economy of the Mount Elicon conflict, will that make you lose the focus of your study? And finally, as you know, the conflict in the Mount Elicon area has been there for a long time, but originally it was just between the Bukusu and the Kabot. Now the supporters are turning against themselves. And I was wondering, is this because now they have lost a common enemy or what motivated? Of course, you are arguing the, about the Kebuku, uh, Kebuku uh, land management. But then you focus on political economy, which could be um, caused by that land management as one form, but what other causes spark this conflict? And were they also, because now Mount Elicon is cosmopolitan, are they also using this as an excuse to affect other communities, especially the ones who have just come in uh, in the 80s? and the letter 70. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, let's listen to Wilson Vitengo. Asante Sada Buana Masika. My two questions, you have not uh, answered them. I think when you find time, you can answer them. Uh, the last question I had is that, did these rac racketeers hijack the war or the war from the beginning? because you are bringing issues of uh, the issue of land, which was the main issue. Did they hijack it to, in order for them to benefit? Thank you, Mr. Masika. Bitengo uh, is our uh, MA student. Uh, let's have Kinuthia, uh, Munia, also uh, one of our students. Yes, we're Kinuthia. Uh, Kinuthia. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Mbogi. Uh, Masika. My concern is within the framework of uh, agenda and the concept. 
Uh, Mwalibu Matika, you agree with me that when we mention about uh, the war in uh, Mount Elgon, the pictures that came to mind were of those of uh, the likes of uh, Fred Capaldi and John Ferut. Now, my concern is uh, these war profiteers, these racketeers, is it gender blind or is it gender blind? Do we have women eh, as uh, uh, profiteers in this war, in, uh, and especially when we, we are talking about the combat economy? Thank you. So you will combine those with the ones on site. Uh, uh, let, let's give uh, Malimu uh, 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 Tabitha uh, the, the the microphone. Uh, Malim, uh, please give it a go. And then uh, we, we have a number of our students here. If you have a question, please, uh, uh, you, you can raise up your hand. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, our guest here. Yes, uh, uh, Malimu Ndogoto. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I must take this opportunity to congratulate uh, Mr. Masika for a good presentation, despite the fact that this is probably does not cut across my, my, my line of study, uh, but I've been able to learn a lot in terms of conflict. And the question that I wanted to, to raise was actually, I was emptied by Professor Nsioka because I wanted maybe to get a correlation between the, the conflict in Mount Helegon at the Rift Valley and the question was answered. But again, probably uh, I, I would like uh, Malimu Masika to give, or, 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 to, to give me or to give the audience a clarification. Is there any correlation between the Sabaut Ladi Defense Force with the Mugiki local militia? that was among us, the Agekoyu, that was formed in the Kenyan Highland. Is there any correlation between these two militias? Mungiki and the Sabaut Land Defense Force. Uh, in a student, yes, we have uh, two students at the back. Uh, there's a gentleman there. Please introduce yourself and say which year you are. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for joining us. Uh, this is the best uh, induction and orientation we can do to you uh -huh. as young scholars. Um, my name is Emmanuel Ngugi, uh, second year, and my question uh, was just brief. Uh, you mentioned about the racketeers, some the government, the, the politicians, and the S SLDF. So my question was, uh, do they who is who enjoys the lion's shares in the Montelgon insurgency situation? Who enjoyed the lion's share of uh, the profits, as you as you stated? Um, was it the government? Was it the, the the SLDF? Was it the the politician? Or they or or they enjoyed the profits in equal parameters? Yeah. Who benefited more? Then, then thank you. We yeah. keep on encouraging our students to join us. Uh, the undergraduates are taking over because uh, the postgraduate ones are not coming. Yes. Um, my name is Ken Karioki, a former student of Mr. Masika. Uh, I have two brief questions. I'll get to it. Uh, what lessons from the economy of war in Montelgon uh, can be applied into other conflict zones in Kenya? And the second question is what challenges that were unique to your study uh, did you encounter? Yes. Okay. There's a next one in front of uh, Mr. Karioke there. Uh, well done, guys. Thank you so much. My name is Barack Ogada, and my question is uh, the role of political leaders when uh, government agencies were being chased out by SLDF, and uh, Fred Kapondi was the area mem uh, member of parliament. What was his role? It may be fueling or even uh, the, the conflict or even bringing solution to the locals. Thank you. Very good. A very uh, direct question, David, there challenges of dealing with contemporary history. Yes, bring it here. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm called Dr. Robert Abilo Kech and a friend to this department. This thank is you the welcome. department which just made me to be what I am today. Uh, mine is just uh, maybe clarification on one or two. Uh, Ms. Masika uh, talked about um, uh, Chiboyuk uh, Settlement Scheme, phase one, two, and three. And he said clearly that one was managed well, two managed well, 
and three was mismanaged by the system. Now, if you talk about the system, this is the same system which was able to manage one properly, two properly. The third one is being mismanaged. There must have been some underlying factors which made the system that mismanage phase three. If you can bring that one out, fair. Two, uh, you talked about the actors. Uh, this is the combat, the end result of combat profit. When you came to uh, shadow, the end result of shadow profit. When you come to the third one, which is coping economy, the end result also is profit. Now, what is it? Is, does it mean that the system is also after profit? Now, what is the other side of the coin? Who is now going to fight the conflict? Thank you. But it was Thank a very, very good much. Yes. presentation. Uh, uh, David, uh, you can respond to that quickly so that we close this. Wow, this is just too much. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I start by my teacher again, Malimu Anyoike. Uh, Malimu is, uh, was asking or asking that uh, we've talked about, uh, it seems that the entire course of this conflict is economy, 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 and where do we leave the common population down there? Where, where do we leave the common uh, population? Uh, the common population, one, falls under the coping economy because they have been pushed into this scenario. Some of them left. Some of them left to other parts of the country. They went as far as Nandi Hills. Some of them went as far as Transoya. Some of them went as far as Kakamega. But within those areas, uh, still they had to develop something to keep them going. So they fall under the coping economy. They struggle to cope because now they have been pushed out there. And I think I talked about that. Now, uh, Professor Wandiba is asking, the archaeology, where is archaeology? Why is archaeology uh, not coming out here? Uh, Prof, I mentioned that if archaeology comes in, then it literally explains the conflict between the Bukusu and the Sabaot because the remnants of the writings on those caves, as Malimu Wafula said, uh, Chonge Fort, which is an archeological, uh, is remnant. Uh, many a times we have engaged in debate and you told me that was a cave, a, a, a fort which belongs to your clan, the Bamuyonga clan. So you see, when you mention all these, then it means that uh, you're going now the inter-ethnic, because the Bukusus will be, this is our mark. The Sabaot will be, this is our mark. The Tachoni will be uh, the trees. These trees that uh, are planted here, they are re re uh, recognized with us. So uh, generally, uh, if we went that way, then you'll see that it brings out the question of inter-ethnic uh, conflict. Then you said, now that the Sabaots have turned against themselves, have they lost the common enemy? And the common enemy here have always been uh, the Bukusu and the, Saba, uh, the, the Bagishu from across in uh, Uganda. No, they have not lost the common enemy. They still believe that the Bukusu are a common enemy. And they still demand that the Bukusus are not Kenyans and should relocate back to Uganda. They also still demand that they will wish that Mount Elgon district is shifted to Trazoya, not to Bungoma. They don't want to be in Bungoma as such. They still demand that they are comfortable in Trazoya and they want to be a part of Trazoya, not uh, Bungoma. They still feel that in Bungoma, they are not comfortable. Now, if you look at the current, I think there is a, a draft bill in uh, parliament, and you realize that one of it is they're demanding that they want a county. 
together with the Kuria people from the other side. They're saying we want our own county because Bungoma, we are being sidelined by the, the, the Bukusus. Now, if you go to their traditional, the, the, interestingly, this community still practice traditional initiation ceremonies. And within those initiation ceremonies, they literally define the enemy. For example, every time uh, when the Bukusus initiate their boys, if a young man withstands a knife, there is a song which is like a national anthem. It must be sung. And this song goes that you have now withstood a knife, you, are, you can kill a sabot or you can kill a Kalenji. And they sing and dance and say, ah, we have killed the Kalenjin. So they still bring it out uh, very uh, strong. And they, you, you would go to the Sabaut, they also uh, do the same. Maybe the young people are taking it differently because if you go to Transoya, Bungoma, you will even hear the Sabaut also joining the Bukusus to sing the same song. But they speak both languages also. Young people might be coming up to kill this uh, narrative, but still the common enemy concept remains so strong. Uh, if you listen to Bukusu music again, uh, they are saying that the Chonge issue is not yet over. And some elders argue that I cannot drink water from the streams called Namubila and Habukoya, because they argue that those streams are the points where majority of Bukusu warriors, when they attacked the Chonge fort, were massacred. And they argue that if I drink the water from this stream, I'm drinking the blood of my people. So the, the concept of the old enemy is still uh, there. Uh, Wilson uh, asked that, did the racketeers hijack the war? Uh, the, the racketeers just benefited uh, from the chaotic scenario and therefore gotten a chance to do their trade, uh, their trade uh, and uh, yes, they might have hijacked the war by supplying it with weapons to fight. But then at the end of the day, uh, you realize that uh, they lacked anarchy. Uh, and the fighters had no connection, particularly the, the foot soldiers might not have had connection with the racketeers. It is the top military command that was benefiting uh, from these uh, weapons. Kinudia is asking, do we, did we have women profiteers? Yes. I mentioned something about post-war economy. Now, here is where women are coming up so strongly. For example, Salome Matakwe is a peace advocator in Mount Elgon. She's campaigning for peace. She's being invited. She actually sits on the peace committee, the district peace committee. But there was a wife to the SLDF commander. So she is benefiting. They, they are still benefiting in post-war uh, economy. And again, behind the cameras, when men bring the loot, some of whom had relocated those women out of Mount Elgon region, who is spending the money? The gender perspective always comes in, uh, in post-conflict economy. So women played uh, a major uh, role. The relationship between, uh, if there is a correlation between uh, SLDF and Mungiki, the center cause of conflict is land. Land, Mungiki, land. SLDF, land. MLDF, land. So land is at the center. So there is that semblance uh, because of the question of land. Who got the giant share? Uh, I see most of these economies in the dark. So it hasn't been evaluated so much to bring out uh, uh, who benefited more in, the, in relation to the amount and, but then uh, we are not very clear who benefited more, but people uh, benefited uh, from it. Uh, 
what lessons can we learn or and how can we apply it? Uh, can we learn from Mount Elgon and how can we apply it to other uh, conflict? The first lesson is, let us not just see the blood. If we want to solve any conflict, look at behind the scenes, which forces are behind. Because you might be dealing with, uh, remember when we started dealing with Al-Shabaab, people started saying, you might be fighting the tail in Somalia. The head is in Nairobi. So can we deal with the head, the, the main source? Uh, when we are told, for example, in Kerio Valley, that the animals are finding their way to Nairobi, Tekla Lorupe, through her peace campaign, said this, that people of Nairobi are financing conflict. The other side, Natembea repeated it. Tekla was the first person to bring it out. And no one listened. And her question was, when you go to buy meat, do you ever ask, this is the blood of that young child that was killed in Kerio Valley the other day. So once we deal with that, uh, the way my senior will say uh, when he's teaching resource conflict, uh, adopting of the, 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 the accord we, which, uh, which dealt with Diamond in, uh, in Sierra Leone, that can we, Kimberly process, can we, make sure that what we are getting is justified. And how can we do this? Can we stop transfer of livestock to this, uh, to slaughter them here? Can we have slaughterhouses down there so that if I steal your cow and take it to the next slaughterhouse, you can follow it and get it there. Then supply meat to Nairobi. Then that will cut down all those conflicts in those areas. But so long as we are still transporting those animals, we might not end uh, that uh, conflict. Um, the role of political leaders, I said they benefit uh, from this, but then some of those sitting political leaders also were victims. Let's take Serut, for example, his home was attacked by SLDF and he was attacked several times. He lost his daughter, he lost the niece uh, when they raided and attacked because they believed that he was defending the Mosop. In as much as he was a soy, and as an MP, he did not come out clearly to say, uh, do not attack the Mosop, uh, do not uh, kill. Uh, he came out saying, don't kill the Mosop. Then they went for him. He also was ejected from his home. Uh, when I went there to collect that, I think I was with Malimu Justice, he had taken refuge. He had ran away with his family. Uh, and uh, so the politicians, also yeah. were at the core of this and also became victims of the same uh, conflict. Uh, finally, uh, Mr. Amila, you are asking uh, the question of mismanagement, uh, that the same, what made the mismanagement? Uh, if you look at the process, that war did not just begin overnight. These people, first of all, they are ev evicted. They lost uh, 19,000 acres. And they are, there they are given 3,900 acres. They demanded that we want equal acre per acre. They were not listened to. And even the land that they were given, it had not been degazetted. It remained under the forest department. That will mean that they could still be ejected, evicted out of it and no one will want to listen to them. They went to court. It's not that they did not begin. They went to court. Courts were not listening. Uh, maybe because of corruption. And when they lost most of those uh, courts, uh, court cases, then they said the best way is to communicate by use of force. Thank you. Uh, Talk about... Uh political leaders, I was wondering whether this is a case of uh, the hunter become, becoming the hunted, uh, something to, uh, to think about. Um, a, a lot of things and a lot of interest, uh, you can see it, uh, David, and uh, I, I know that there could be more questions from the audience, but we have uh, uh, to stop here. Uh, but in one of the 
questions that raised and the way you responded it about um, circumcision songs. Uh, it reminded me of uh, the circumcision song of my own community uh, when I was made a man. They actually remind you of um, the fact that you have now become a man uh, and there are specific roles that you have to play uh, in the community. One of them, of course, is procreation. They, they tell you directly that you have to procreate. And uh, the other one is um, to defend uh, the community from its enemies. And then we list uh, the, the enemies. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Nyanchoga and uh, Malimundigi, uh, you, you know that. Uh, it, it is probably time and for the MA students who are looking for uh, themes to study. Uh, that, that's something to look at. Well, what does that do to a young warrior like me at the age of about 14, when I'm being told I'm now a man? Uh, can go out, go ye and procreate uh, and then defend the community against our enemies. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah, you know, so we, we need to have uh, a conversation around uh, uh, folklore, uh, culture and, and, and conflicts in, and, and how uh, the two interface and engage in making conflicts intractable when you grow up knowing that so and so is my enemy. And it's my duty as a man to defend us against. That's something interesting. Um, the, the other issue is the atrocities visited on uh, very innocent people, doctors uh, doing the noble duty of uh, vaccinating kids in a hospital. Instead, they were vaccinated by bullets. Uh, did you hear him saying that? I mean, uh, beautiful women losing their ears and mouths. Uh, you, you know, we, we, we need to begin to rethink of um, uh, conflicts of this kind. The other dimension, again, the MA students who are looking for themes to study, there's a very interesting international dimension uh, to the conflict in Mount Elgon. Uh, that's, that's a whole MA and, or PhD, another PhD project. Uh, uh, you know, how did the arrows from Korea uh, get to Mount Elgon? How did guns from Europe get to Mount Elgon? Uh, how, you know, uh, somebody needs to look at that important international dimension and, 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 and um, how it shaped the, the conflict probably differently, uh, much more than it could have been if it was arrows, stones, and sticks involved, maybe. So, so th th there is a lot. Uh, but friends, uh, um, our next presentation will be on um, uh, on uh, the 9th of, 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 of March, and we are having uh, our one of our associates, Rose Miyonga, uh, a PhD candidate in the University of Warwick, speaking to us on Mau Mau as history of emotions. We, we are going back to Mau Mau again. You remember our... International Conference last year on Mau Mau. We are going to Mau Mau again in our next presentation on the 9th of March. Same time, same place. Rose Miyonga will be speaking on Mau Mau as a history of emotions. And Dr. Margaret Gachehe will be the moderator and the discussant for, for the day. I now want to welcome Justice to give a vote of thanks. Talking about culture, in my culture, uh, the praise that carries a lot of weight is the one that comes from your age mate, your contemporary. Uh, so uh, David and uh, Justice are age mates and contemporaries, intellectually speaking. So it's only in order to welcome Justice to give a vote of thanks and sing a bit of praises to David. Or is it good evening? Uh, thanks for making it here this afternoon to listen to David, uh, who has been my classmate and seen my classmate for a long time. Thank you for what you presented. Uh, thank you for giving us uh, a portrait of Mount Elgon. Uh, and in there, I think we picked a number of dimensions, a number of um, 
nuances uh, that as Dr. Ombonga just said, our students can pick and basically get topics to write on so many things from the place of the state in this in that conflict. And the same, of course, can apply in Kerio Valley, uh, the place of uh, profit, uh, the place of these militias, uh, the hierarchy need, uh, the, the responses, the government decisions, women, right? And my NGOs probably, the border across in Uganda, the archaeology, uh, as you heard from Professor Wandiba, so much. So thank you, David, for you know, nourishing us uh, this afternoon. And uh, we hope that uh, this will take us uh, a long way in understanding our Kenya and hopefully making it better uh, in terms of uh, peace. So it's my honor now uh, to thank you again for making it here this afternoon in this congregation, uh, particularly uh, Professor and Zioka and Professor Ahome and the rest of you, all right, for leaving your schedules to be here. I want to thank the online team that was able also to you know, uh, be in uh, from Professor Wandiba uh, and uh, Marmonyek and the rest. Thank you again to our students, the MS students, and probably PhD students uh, for making it here, you're learning and probably you're picking topics. Thank you for our undergraduate students. Uh, thank you for our undergraduate students also for making it here, and we encourage you to keep attending. So as it is, uh, let's see each other in the next two weeks uh, when you have the next presentation, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll keep coming uh, to the end of this series. Thank you again, and may God bless you.